By well before the outbreak of war, the English coast was scattered with interception stations, where hundreds of female army auxiliaries permanently listened to the German army's frequencies and transcribed the messages intercepted in Morse code. Incomprehensible messages, since they were coded. As far as codes are concerned, the Germans had developed what they considered the ultimate weapon. They replaced the old methods with a machine, a machine named Enigma that could be configured in 1,000 million, million, million different ways. To break just one of its messages by brute force, one of today's computers would have to run for an entire year. Turing had never seen an Enigma machine, but he would soon know it down to the smallest detail. So we have here an Enigma machine, a rotor cipher device. The idea behind it is that when I push a letter on the keyboard, this letter is encoded by another letter. For example, when I press the key D, the K lamp lights up. Inside the machine, each rotor has internal wiring that transforms the letter entered into another. A D arrives in the first rotor, but an R comes out. The R then becomes a U, then finally a K, and it is the letter K that lights up on the box. It would, of course, be too simple a code if every time I press the letter D, the K lit up. So, as you can see, when I press the D again, now another letter lights up, the U. Each time a letter is entered into the keyboard, at least one of the rotors turns to the extent that the electric circuit changes and ends on another letter. To decode a message, you have to know the machine's initial configuration. The message receiver needed to know the rotor's starting position chosen by the transmitter. When the rotors were configured in the same way, he could then type the encoded message on the keyboard and receive the decoded message on the lamp board. The advantage of this Enigma machine was that a message could be encrypted and decrypted with the same encoding settings. That was the idea. But as history has shown, it turned out to be the machine's weakness. In 1938, Turing was in the United States, in Princeton, where he was carrying out fundamental research on mathematical intuition. He traveled, discovered Washington, New York, and began to take an interest in cryptography, the art of encoding and decoding. In it, he found a sort of hobby that gave him a rest from serious mathematics, inventing secret codes. One of them is pretty well impossible to decode without the key and very quick to encode. I expect I could sell them to HM government for quite a substantial sum, but I'm rather doubtful about the morality of such things. On September the 1st, 1939, the Nazi army smashed into Poland. September the 4th, 1939, the day after Great Britain entered the war, Alan Turing was summoned to Bletchley Park, where the British code-breaking service was headquartered. He discovered an atypical establishment where military discipline had to adapt to very peculiar recruits. So at the moment we're in the library of Bletchley Park Mansion and the mansion is um, very much the same as it would have been when Turing arrived here on the first full day of the war. The atmosphere here at the beginning must have been quite strange. One of the code breakers described it as um, rather prim and rather like the first day at an English public school. About 30 people had been recruited. Archaeologists, linguists, chess champions, there are even crossword fans. And only two mathematicians, 
which would suggest the British authorities still saw codes as more of a literary than a mathematical problem. It's hard to imagine the sorts of people that were employed here and who thrived in the Bletchley Park environment even being employed in a secret organisation in Germany. Here, of course, there were homosexuals, there were Jews, there were anarchists, there were free thinkers, and their talents combined in this um, unholy, ungoverned, brilliant um, crucible of code breaking that there was here at Bletchley Park. But even in this small world of cryptologists, Turin did not go unnoticed. He despised social norms that he intended to sift through rationality. If he wore a gas mask in the summer, it was not due to a chemical alert, but because he was fighting hay fever. Little by little, the organisation at Bletchley Park was set up. Every day, operators in the interception stations transcribed hundreds of messages, unreadable messages that piled up on the cryptologist desks with little result. And yet the English cryptologists had two exact replicas of the Enigma machine. They'd been handed over by the Polish a few weeks before their country was invaded. But actually having the machines here was not that much help in breaking them because Enigma was designed um, to remain secure even if it was captured by the enemy. With a code, a code generating machine, there are kind of two separate tasks. If you don't already know how it works, then you need to work out um, how the machine is engineered, how many wheels has it got, how do they operate together. You need to break the machine, as they say. And then the second part of the task is to devise um, code breaking methods that will enable you to read the daily messages that are, are sent by the German machines. And that was the hard part. That was where the brilliance and the ingenuity was needed. Alan Turing would tackle the Enigma problem head on and explore the way it operated in the tiniest detail. But while the old code breakers used graph paper and a pencil sharpener, Turing was convinced that most of the reasoning produced by the human mind could be mechanised. What if you needed a machine to fight a machine? Jean Valentine was an operator on one of those strange machines during World War II. Fifty years later, she returned to Bletchley Park, where she works as a guide. This machine, invented by Alan Turing, is called a BOMB, B-O-M-B-E. -B -E. It does a fantastic job searching for the settings on the rotors of the Enigma machines. This is equivalent to 36 Enigmas. One, two, three, four, five, six, the same. Twelve in each of these banks, and three twelves are 36. These drums, they're called, rotate, connecting with the commutator on the back panel. There are four little brushes behind every letter. See, letters all the way round. And each of these little uh, brushes has got 19 filaments in it. And these are connecting with the commutators on the back panel. Starting in 1940, the English mass-produced bombs. They enable systematic exploration of the Enigma machine's millions of possible configurations. When it stops, as it will from time to time, there will be letters pointed out on these indicator drums. And these are the possible settings. We telephone this information through just to an extension number. And when I was here, I didn't know where we were ringing. 
When I came here to train as a guide 15 years ago, I discovered that these bits of information were going across the path a good, what, 10 meters. <laughs> Though I didn't know where it was going, and I'm sure they didn't know where it was coming from. Because here, secrecy was the order of the day. You didn't talk about what you were doing beyond the walls of the hut that you worked in. You told nobody what your job was, not even your closest relations, husbands or boyfriends or fathers, mothers, anything. You didn't. You were told not to speak, so we didn't. The bombs were one of the best kept secrets of World War II. Thanks to them, not just one message was decrypted from time to time, tens of thousands of them were. The English now had bulk access to a mass of information. Orders to attack or retreat, combat reports, troop morale and material status, weather reports, naval or aerial reconnaissance results, damage reports, requests for reinforcement. Everything or close to it went through Enigma and arrived decrypted and translated on the desks of the Allied command. But in addition to the role played in the war proceedings, it was the first time a machine set foot in a field hitherto the domain of human intelligence. Breaking codes is an activity that requires great intelligence when human beings do it. And here was a machine that was doing the work um, that human code breakers did. It was a machine that was um, performing tasks that require intelligence when human beings do them. If it is accepted that real brains, as found in animals, and in particular in men, are a sort of machine, it will follow that our digital computer, suitably programmed, will behave like a brain. But in the late summer of 1940, piercing the mysteries of thought was not a priority, even for Turing. Ever since the French surrendered, Great Britain stood alone against Germany. In September came the Blitz. The Luftwaffe pounded England. London, Coventry, Plymouth, Birmingham, Liverpool. The major urban centres were systematically targeted and the civilian losses were considerable. Thanks to the first bombs, the enigma used by the Luftwaffe was decrypted and the Royal Air Force retaliated with ever-increasing efficiency. But the battle suddenly changed course. Since Hitler could not invade Great Britain, he decided to starve it. In June of 1940, Karl Dönitz, commander-in-chief of the Kriegsmarine submarine fleet, visited Lorient and decided to install there a gigantic submarine base, as well as his command center. His mission was to cut the shipping routes that Great Britain was entirely dependent on for its oil, metal, wood, and food. It was from this charming seaside villa, beneath which a network of bunkers was dug, that Donitz would lead the decisive battle of the Atlantic. L'augmentation progressive. Ça commence très doucement. The increasing number of submarines available at the front what the Germans called the frontline U-boats, will enable Donitz to implement a tactic that he conceived back in 1935 when he began development of the submarine division, that is to say, the Wolfpack tactic. Donitz used a map of the North Atlantic divided into numbered squares. Each submarine established radio contact at least once a day to report its position and receive further instructions. Donitz could thus deploy the U-boats like pieces on a chessboard. 
As soon as one of them spotted a convoy, it reported its position to the command center, which then gathered all the U-boats available for a grouped attack. On the evening of October the 17th, 1940, a convoy of 35 ships loaded with metal and wood was spotted by the submarine U-48. Dönitz sent five submarines to simultaneously attack it. In a single night, they sank 20 ships. It was the Wolfpack tactic first major victory. Before, submarines attacked in isolation, so they could sink at most two to three ships, at the very best. Five submarines, though, 20 ships. By the end of 1940, hundreds of ships had already been sunk, and more than five million tons lost to the bottom of the ocean. This short propaganda film shows the efforts of the military authorities to warn soldiers of the deadly consequences of talking about classified information, especially when they fall upon the wrong ears. But propaganda was not enough. The U-boat seemed well on the way to winning the Battle of the Atlantic. However, the Wolfpack tactic had a flaw. It made extensive use of the radio. Cracking the code used by the U-boats would potentially allow the Allies to reverse the balance of power. The problem is that there wasn't one enigma, but many enigmas. The Germans used separate networks for their communications. One for the Western Luftwaffe, another for the infantry on the Russian front and yet another for submarines in the Atlantic. Each network had its own keys, its own procedures, and sometimes its own variants of the Enigma machine. The one used in U-boats, known as Dolphin at Bletchley Park, was particularly difficult to decipher. When you are 3,000 kilometers out in the middle of the Atlantic, you don't have the capability of using a communication cable. The Navy was therefore dependent on the development of radio communication. This is a very important point. That's why the Navy always tried to achieve the highest standards of security from Enigma. Everyone at Bletchley Park seemed to think that the naval Enigma was invulnerable. Alistair Denniston, the commander-in-chief at Bletchley Park, even made this surprising statement. You know the Germans don't mean you to read their stuff, and I don't suppose you ever will. But it was obvious to Turing how important it was to break naval enigma. Um, and also it was a problem that, that had a, um, a peculiar appeal to him because he was a lone worker. And since no one else was touching naval enigma, he thought, this is the problem for me, I can have it to myself. Around the manor, they began to build barracks. Huts, in Bletchley Park jargon. Turing moved into Hut 8, dedicated to the naval enigma. He would spend days and nights there on his own, poring over the stacks of incomprehensible messages. This is the original Hut 8. This is Turing's office that we're sitting in at the moment. Turing was head of Hut 8 and this is where the Battle of the Atlantic was won. Hidden in these strings of characters, almost within reach, he knew there was vital information that could save lives, maybe change the course of the war. Days went by, blending into one another. All attempts systematically failed. And then finally, a night came along like no other. Turing had several ideas on this particular evening that cracked open the door a bit on the naval enigma. The date of that night went unrecorded, but it's one of the most significant nights in the history of the Second World War. Um, 
it was a real double whammy from Turing. He, he broke into the, the new additional feature of the naval enigma messages that had made them so difficult to break. And um, that same night, he invented a method called Banbarismus, which was used in breaking into the daily enigma traffic. If we superimpose two character strings at random, the probability of getting two identical letters is, for each letter, 1 in 26. In contrast, in a German text, some letters are more common than others, so the probability is significantly greater, 1 in 17. It is on this basis that Turin invented a mathematical method to synchronize two encrypted texts, thus multiplying the possibilities for decryption. The naval enigma no longer seemed out of reach. Yet just a little nudge from fate was still needed. In the spring of 1941, a series of German ships were captured, allowing Turing and his team to complement their knowledge. In one incident in June, a damaged German submarine was forced to surface. The commander gave the order to abandon ship. He and all the crew jumped overboard, but the submarine, against all odds, did not sink. The English immediately deployed a vessel and crew who managed to board and seize a complete enigma with documents including codes for several months. Submarines in operation left port with three months of codes, so there were still codes for several weeks. Thanks to this new intelligence, and with the help of the bombs, Hut 8 would succeed in deciphering the naval enigma on a daily basis, so well that the Admiralty would know the day-to-day -day positions of all U-boats present in the North Atlantic. This information allowed the Allied convoys to slip between the concentrations of submarines. During the 23 days following the first decryption, no German submarines would succeed in spotting an Allied convoy. The calculations made after the war showed that 30% of the convoys, thus 30% of the tonnage transported by convoys, escaped destruction thanks to this code-breaking. While the Battle of the Atlantic wasn't tipped in the right direction by this fact alone, it was indeed a decisive factor in the battle. 